Happy New Year and welcome back to the monthly IOP lectures held at the Open University. This year we have decided to add an additional lecture in January. Normally we don't start our lectures until February and the risk of poor weather has passed. However, with online lectures, this is hopefully less of a risk for everyone and we hope that you are wrapped up warm at home. Sadly, with the current situation still ongoing, we are not going to be holding any lectures on site for the foreseeable future. Our previous lectures have all been recorded and are either available online at this website in Stadium or the School of Physical Sciences YouTube channel. This lecture will also be recorded and uploaded to the YouTube channel at a later date. We are live streaming our call. But as you can see, you will have no direct contact or intera uh, with us and we're not interacting directly with the audience. This is for everyone's internet safety. If you would like to ask a question, please email them to stem-sbs-iop-lecture at open.ac.uk. The email address should be in the details above your video screen. And the questions will be asked at the end of the lecture. Uh, as you would have also seen when you joined the stadium page, we have a link to a demographic survey at the top of the page. We'd be really grateful for you to fill this in. This data is entirely anonymous, but it gives a real insight to how we advertise these lectures. We really want to make sure we reach as many people as possible. Uh, our next lecture after this one will be held on the 9th of February, given by Professor Nicholas Braithwaite, who is the Executive Dean of the Faculty of STEM here at the OU. Nick has very excitingly been recently awarded the Lawrence Bragg Medal from the IOP for his outstanding contribution to the authentic teaching of practical science through the development of the award-winning Open STEM Labs, which is available to all learners in all places and at all times. It's how we at the OU are able to deliver our high standard of lab uh, experiments. So this lecture is going to be given in recognition of that award. His talk will be titled X-rays, waves and particles seen from a distance. The lecture will begin at 7.30. However, fingers crossed, we are hoping to have a level of interactivity before and potentially after the lecture. So please keep an eye out for on our social media and our web page for updates. Information will be advertised as usual through the IEP. And please email us or email email martin at iop.org to be asked to be added to the Milton Teens talk list. More information will be available on our website and through our social media, so please make sure to keep an eye on those. Finally, after my list, long list of preamble to make sure you have all the information, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ben Still. Ben followed an interest in rocket science at the University of Leicester, where he did a master's in physics with space science and technology. But by the time he left Leicester, his interest had swayed particle physics. He obtained a PhD in experimental particle physics from the University of Sheffield, where he had joined the international T2T, I'm going to say it right this time, I've said it wrong all day, neutrino particle physics experiment in its formative years, finalising the design of one of the experiment's subdetectors and developing AI techniques to reconstruct and identify particles. Once he had obtained his PhD, he continued his work with this group uh, after he moved to Tween Mary University of London, where he became heavily involved in the university's outreach program. He continues his outreach work as an honorary research fellow at Green Mary's alongside teaching physics in schools and writing popular science books. So without any further ado, please let me pass over to Ben, who will be giving us a talk about particle physics, Brit by Brit. So if you want to go ahead and share, Ben, I will spot, we'll make sure you're spotlighted. Fantastic. Thank you, Alice. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so we're going to be talking today um, about particle physics, but I'm a big fan of using um, Lego and analogies really in everything that I do, um, just an excuse to be a big kid. Um, and so the idea in behind this talk is that um, essentially if you had enough Lego bricks, you should be able to follow the rules that we're going to go through and build your very own universe in those famous plastic bricks. So we're going to start by talking about the word analogy, because as I say, um, but by using a Lego brick to try and talk about subatomic particles, of course, there's lot, going to be lots of differences, but there are also lots of similarities that can help us understand a bit more about particle physics. Um, and so an analogy is just a comparison to try and aid explanation or clarification. And my argument is that this is very similar to scientific research. In fact, scientific theories are our own, are our own analogy of nature itself. 
Now, of course, a scientific theory isn't all of nature and it can't encompass all of nature. For that, so for those of you who like Venn diagrams, if we imagine nature as this all encompassing beast and we think about the scientific theories we currently have, our scientific theories cannot explain all of nature. We know this because there are known unknowns like dark matter and dark energy. But of course, there has to be also other unknown unknowns. We know that we can't, with our scientific theories, currently explain all of nature. And in the same sense, everyday analogies can be used, if used correctly, to describe scientific theories. And I think this is quite a powerful thing as an educator, and I really enjoy doing this, and especially in teaching people to figure out where these everyday analogies break down. And I'm going to talk about that in the talk, because if you can figure out where an everyday analogy breaks down and no longer actually explains a scientific theory that it's trying to explain, then you are learning the skills of a researcher because a scientific researcher is doing that just with more complicated analogies that we call scientific theories. And they are trying to figure out where those scientific theories break down and where nature actually takes over. And so if we actually learn through analogies, we might become better researchers. Anyway, that's my argument as an educator. So I'm going to start by talking um, about Lego. And that's my everyday analogy. And I'm going to use Lego to talk about a theory called the standard model of particle physics. The standard model of particle physics is our current best model for explaining the subatomic world and how it constructed in the early moments of the universe to essentially build the universe we live today. But of course, we may touch on a little bit of nature because the standard model we know full well is not the end game. We already know that it has a limitation and we know what those limitations are, yet we still haven't found a way past the standard model into understanding more about nature. Ben, can I just interrupt you? I don't think we can see any slides, if that's all right. Oh, OK. I don't think you're sharing just at the moment. Oh, OK. Um, that's a shame. Uh, let me try again. Is that working now? Oh, it's doing something. Yeah, it's working now. Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry about that. I am really sorry. I'm really sorry. Um, you haven't missed much. You've missed me just doing some rather uh, funny Venn diagrams. I apologize for that. Uh, if we get time, I'll go back over uh, the slide. But it was really just um, the definition of analogy and me talking about how I want to uh, use this analogy as an excuse to talk about particle physics. So sorry about that. Um, but anyway, we're, we're going to start um, at the beginning and we're going to start talking about atomism because atomism is the is the philosophy behind particle physics. And and the idea is so John Dalton in 1803 came up with his modern atomic theory, saying that everything in the universe was made up of small solid spheres of different properties that basically made all the chemical elements and therefore everything in the universe that we live in. Um, and so it was understood that they were indivisible at that particular time. But that all changed at the end of the 19th century when electrons were discovered by J.J. Thompson. Electrons were discovered to be much, much lighter than the atom and therefore had to have come from within the atom itself, suggesting that the atom was actually splittable. And then um, just after the turn of the 20th century, the nucleus was discovered something again smaller than an atom inside of an atom and shortly after it was discovered that the nucleus was made of further smaller things these things protons and neutrons and in fact when we get to protons neutrons and electrons we can describe all of the periodic table because all of the elements on the periodic table and uh, the atoms that make them up um, are simply a collection of protons and neutrons in a central nucleus and an electron around the outside. And so really, surely that's all we need for our entire universe. Nice and simple. End of lecture. Well, things got a bit more complicated when in 1968 the quark was discovered. Now, quarks are particles which combine to make protons and neutrons. As it turns out, protons and neutrons can actually be split apart. But currently, our understanding within the standard model is that quarks and electrons are indeed actually indivisible. They are the, seem to be the smallest things that we can actually use to build a universe from. 
And so the standard model focuses on understanding quarks and electrons and particles like them and how they build together to form everything else. So there are three particles which make up those protons, neutrons, and of course the electron itself is not a composite particle. Now, there are two quarks that make up a proton and a neutron, an up quark and a down quark, and they combine in different ways to form a proton. Two up quarks on top of one down quark makes a proton, and two down quarks below an up quark makes a neutron. They are just different combinations of three of these up or down quarks. And then the electron, of course, is its own particle. It doesn't seem to have any smaller components. And then there are particles which are rather strange and rather ghostly. And if you've not heard of these particles, I don't blame you. But you might be surprised to know that there are tens of billions of these particles flowing through your body every single second. And most of them will be coming from the sun. I know it's dark outside, but um, they will see pretty much all matter as more transparent than light sees glass. And so they pass through everything entirely. These particles are called neutrinos. Neutrinos are an essential part of the subatomic world, and we'll talk a little bit about where they come into play in a second. Um, but essentially, it seems that actually, with the neutrino adding in um, a little bit of extra freedom, these four particles seem to be all we need to build a universe. Again, we seem to have got to everything that we need. But when you start looking at high energy scenarios, so particle accelerators, cosmic rays, um, or even uh, you know, environments in the death throes of stars and black holes, then you actually see that for some reason, nature has chosen that there are two further sets of these original four particles. There doesn't seem to be a reason why, um, but these sets of particles are essentially exactly the same in most cases to the first four, apart from the fact that they are heavier in mass. Now, this means that they are less stable than the first four particles of up, down, electron and electron neutrino. Um, and we see this because these heavier versions of themselves actually decay and change into the lighter versions of themselves pretty rapidly. So the up quark is joined by the charm quark and the top quark. All properties the same, but the top is heavier than the charm and the charm is heavier than the up. Then there's the strange quark and the bottom quark. Again, very similar in properties, but the bottom is heavier than the strange and the strange heavier than the down. And then the electron is joined by two heavier versions as well, the muon and the tau or the tauon. And the neutrino also has heavier versions of itself associated with these electrically charged particles. And so this, these are truly what we understand right now to be the fundamental building blocks of nature. These seem to be all of the building blocks of matter that are required to make literally anything in the universe. So including exotic matter that isn't on the periodic table. And so we've got some building blocks. But what about the construction rules? Well, the construction rules that are needed come from the forces of nature. Now, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the force that you're most familiar with doesn't really come into play when we're talking about particle physics. Gravity is, of course, keeping you on the seat right now, but um, it's far too weak and the masses of particles far too small for them to have any effect on the subatomic level. One force that you probably are familiar with um, is that of electromagnetism. And this does hold a lot of sway when it comes to particles that are subatomic, but they have to have an electric charge. And the reason we're familiar with electromagnetism and gravity is because they have essentially an infinite range. So for instance, not only does gravity keep the moon around the earth, the earth around the sun, and the sun in orbit around a galaxy, but it also keeps groups of galaxies together and so on. So the range of gravity is essentially infinite. You can understand that electromagnetism is infinite if I tell you that the force of electromagnetism is exchanged using light. And we know that we can see light coming from galaxies billions of light years in the distance. And that light is essentially traveled on an almost infinite journey.
And so electromagnetism is the one which dictates a lot of how particles interact with one another. And in fact, it's how we see those particles in particle detectors. There are two further forces, which if you haven't heard of them, again, I can't really blame you because the, their range is not infinite. In fact, it's so small that they are limited to the atomic nucleus. Now, there is something called the strong force. The strong force keeps quarks together to form protons and neutrons. But a residual of the strong force also keeps protons and neutrons stuck together to form a nucleus as well. And the range is roughly about the size of a small nucleus. And then there is a force called the weak force. And the weak force is even more strange because unlike the others, which produce pushes and pulls to actually pull particles together or push them apart, the weak force isn't a force like that at all. It is actually something which transforms particles from one thing to another. And so it's not a push or a pull, but a change. And again, that is limited to something about the size of a proton. So we need to understand a little bit more about these forces before we can get to some kind of um, some kind of construction rule, really. Um, and I'm going to start with gravity. I know I said it doesn't have any sway in particles, but it's something that we're familiar with. And we're familiar with the fact that a ball sat at the top of a valley like this will fall down and eventually come to rest at the bottom of the valley. Now, the reason that this ball does this is because it's lowering itself in potential energy. And essentially, if there's one rule that you can learn in physics that applies everywhere, it is that the entire universe and everything in it would like to be at the lowest energy state available to it. And so if this ball is free to roll down to a lower position, it will do because it wants that lower energy state. And this is the reason why the moon and the Earth are attracted to one another, because there is a lower potential energy in between the two of them. And of course, with gravity, we're talking about something called gravitational potential energy. And as something falls down, it lowers in gravitational potential energy and becomes more stable. So the Earth moon system would be more stable if they were together. Um, and this also applies to electric charge. Now, if we cast our minds back, um, some of you may have to cast your mind back just earlier today, but some of you may have to cast your minds back further to our school lessons. And the idea that electrically charged objects feel forces of attraction and repulsion. Now, oppositely charged particles feel an, a force of attraction, positive and negative, are attracted and forced towards one another. And the reason for this being is that the electric potential from the electromagnetic force is lower in between the two of them. And so all they are doing by coming together is they are seeking that lower energy. And so it's a natural phenomenon then that they feel a force towards one another because it guides them towards that lower potential energy. Now then, what about like charges because we know that they repel one another how does potential work with those well potential works with those in the fact that they repel one another because in fact the potential energy rises in between two electrically charged particles with the same charge and they fall apart so something that's electrically neutral by positive and negative come together is lower in potential energy and in fact, we'll find this when we talk about the strong force. Now, anything which has a, um, a essentially zero net charge in one of these forces is lower in potential energy. So electric neutrality is lower in potential energy. Now, if you want to know how the potential energy or the potential relates to the force, um, it's to do with the gradient of this potential line. The gradient tells us the strength of the force, the steeper the gradient, then the greater the force. Um, and, and so you can see that as the particles get close together, the potential energy gradient steepens and the force gets greater. So the thing which defines force in gravity is the mass of objects. The thing which defines the force between particles in electromagnetism is their electric charge. Now, the smallest unit known of electronic of electric charge is the electronic charge, which is the charge on the electron or the magnitude of the charge on the electron. 
Essentially, everything which has an electric charge is some multiple of this really small number. We say that it is the quantum of electronic charge. Everything else has to be built up from this. Um, and the electron, as mentioned, has a negative one in terms of the electronic charge. And so too does its heavier versions of the muon and the tau. The uplight quark has a plus two thirds of this electronic charge. Now, I may sound like I've just contradicted myself by saying that the electronic charge is actually the smallest charge possible. The reason that the quarks can have a fractional charge like this is that quarks are never actually found by themselves. They're always found, as mentioned, in groups of three, like protons and neutrons. And, and that actually negates the fact that um, we can have this uh, kind of fractional charge. But just like the up quark, the charm on the top have the same electronic charge. But again, their masses are different. Down light quarks, the down quark and the strange in the bottom have a negative one third of this electronic charge. And the reason neutrinos aren't really that interesting right now is that they don't have an electric charge at all. In fact, all of them have zero electronic charge and so don't interact via electromagnetism whatsoever. So let's focus on these quarks and electrically charged lepton particles. So as mentioned, the fact that a positive charge and a negative charge come together to form neutrality is simply because when they become neutral um, or try and neutralize their charges, then they are lower in potential energy. And we can put an electric charge on a one dimensional number line like this. It can be as positive as you like, as far to the right, or it can be as negative as you like, as far to the left. Now, the idea of electric charge as being a positive or negative number is just an analogy. There's no deeper meaning behind positive and negative. It was something which um, was the brainchild of Benjamin Franklin. He was a polymath who, until then, electricity had been known as vitreous and resonous, two literally different named types of electricity. But... Benjamin Franklin wanted to start talking about electronic charge in terms of a quantity of a, of a fluid. And so he came up with the idea of positive and negative charges. And so the idea of these num this number line is just an analogy for um, what we describe as electric charge. OK, um, but when it comes to the strong force, it gets a bit complicated because we can't use a one dimensional number line that we do with um, electric charge. In fact, we can't use two dimensions. To describe the strong force, we actually need to think about things in three dimensions. So it's like going from um, a piece of paper to a box. You've got to really think in terms of uh, something totally different. And the analogy that is chosen is the analogy of color vision. Now, I'm, I apologize. This was billed as a physics lecture, but there's a bit of biology coming. OK, and I apologize to any biologists if I really mess this up. Um, but um, our eye at the back of it has a photosensitive region. Uh, so photosensitive uh, layer of cells called the retina. Now, in this retina, there are a number of different cells called rods and cones. The rods are generally sensitive across mo a very broad range of um, light and give us the, the light and dark, basically, in our vision. Whereas the cones are, sorry, uh, whereas the cones are uh, come in three different types and they're responsible for giving us our color vision. Now, there is um, a particular type of cone which is sensitive more in the blue region of the electromagnetic spectrum or visible light spectrum. There is a cone which is sensitive predominantly in the green portion of the visible light spectrum. And then there is a cone which is um, sensitive more into the red predominantly. And so with these three different types of cell, we build up and construct within our minds every other color that we see. And we see essentially just in red, green and blue. And this is why the screen you're probably looking at right now has um, LEDs, which are just producing red, green and blue light in certain amounts. And then your brain is mixing that red, green and blue and turning it into the color that um, you are thinking that you're seeing. And so 
the analogy works in that if you mix all three of those colours, red, green and blue, then our brain thinks that we are seeing pure white light. And so in this analogy of charge, this analogy of colour charge, neutrality is essentially pure white light in which we don't see any predominant colour. And so if we want to create something which is colour neutral, we can't do it with just two colour charges, which would represent, say, two quarks. We would actually need a minimum of three for this to work. And that means that our axes, instead of being positive and negative numbers, are red, green and blue colour axes. So this is different to the idea of mathematics. But again, it's just an analogy which is used to explain the observations that we see in terms of these particles. Now, you may have been questioning yourself as to the colours of my proton quarks and neutron quarks from my earlier slide. And what you'll notice is that, um, for instance, the down quark in my diagram is blue, but my down quarks in the neutron are green and red. And that is because the colour charge does not define what type of quark it is. The electric charge is unique to each type of quark, but the colour charge is not. So we can think of it as there being three types of up quark, each of them red, green and blue, three types of down quark, red, green and blue. And in fact, all of the other quarks have red, green and blue versions of themselves. But the thing is, we can never actually see the colour of the quark because as soon as they have formed these proton and neutron particles, they are colour neutral. We can't tell which quark is red, which quark is green, which quark is blue. All we see is the particle. And the way that I try in this analogy to describe protons is that there are two up-like uh, up -like quarks on top and one down-like quark on the bottom. So the way I try and show up and down quarks in this analogy is by their placing on the diagrams. Now this, as mentioned, is a rather strange one. The weak force is involved not in pushing or pulling, it is involved in transforming. Um, and the weak force pairs up different couples of particles. So the up and the down, the charm, the strange, the top, the bottom, the electron and its neutrino, the muon and its neutrino, and the tau and its neutrino. And they are coupled because the weak force allows them to transform from one to the other through the exchange of another particle, which is to do with the weak force, but essentially it allows us to transform one particle into another. And what's of most interest for us, because we need protons and neutrons really to build our universe, is that up quarks and down quarks can be interchanged using this weak force. And so that tells us that in a process um, and you may be familiar with this from, again, your school days, a process of beta decay takes a neutron with two down quarks and one up quark, and it turns it into, through a transformation, a proton, and in the process releases an electron and a neutrino as well. And so this process of beta decay allows neutrons to turn into protons, and in fact, it also allows the other way around, because by turning a neutron into a proton, we are turning one of the down quarks into an up quark and in the process releasing an electron and a neutrino. This is important because to be able to turn a neutron into a proton or in fact a proton into a neutron is really important for creating a universe because the nucleus of atoms, as I mentioned, are made of protons and neutrons. And we need to be able to have both of them to create our atom. So I've kind of gone through all the construction rules now, right? It may seem simplistic, but hopefully um, you, know, you've, you, you follow me. Um, so the strong force allows us to uh, create proton and neutron particles, and it forces quarks to group together into groups of threes to form these particles, to form something which is color neutral and has no overall color charge. The negative and positive particles come together through the electromagnetic force to, to create things which are electrically neutral. Again, because 
electrically neutral and color neutral are low in energy. And then the weak force allows us this trick of being able to transform particles if we need to, or if, for instance, it allows us to lower our energy. OK, I'm going to take a quick sip because now we're going to go through the history of the universe, the entire history of the universe from Big Bang right through to modern day. Well, I say the entire history of the universe, certainly the most interesting bits anyway. I mean, halfway through this diagram is 10 seconds after the Big Bang and then 380,000 years is our next line here. Um, and then, yes, it's just a bit of cosmology after that. I'm definitely going to focus on the early universe because I think, as I say, as a particle physicist, this is the bit I'm most interested in. So the universe started off as a mess of particles. This mess of particles was extremely hot and extremely dense. And these particles are moving so fast that they could overcome all of the forces, even the strong force. But as the universe started to grow older, it expanded outwards. As it expanded, it started to cool down. If you've ever experienced by spraying a deodorant can for too long, the can cools down because of the expanding gas. And so as it expands outwards, the energy is spread out and the particles slow down to the point where um, to the point where um, the soup of quarks and electrons actually start to crystallize out and the quarks crystallize first to form protons with two up quarks and a down quark. There were some neutrons around, but the majority would have formed these kind of particles. And it is this strong force which forces the quarks to form these particles, as mentioned, because it no longer uh, the quarks have no longer got enough energy to escape the pull of this um, color charge inwards. Our next part of the history of the universe occurs in the first few minutes. In the first few minutes, the universe is still very hot, so hot that even though um, protons have the same charge, they're moving fast enough to overcome that repulsion still. If one of these protons actually through the weak force turned into a neutron, which is obviously possible, um, then what will happen is if that neutron collided with a proton, they could, for they could stick together and forge something called deuterium, which is a heavy version of hydrogen gas. It is simply a proton with a neutron attached. If that deuterium collided with a proton, it would form another isotope of um, the next element in the periodic table, helium-3, with two protons on the bottom here and one neutron on the top. And then if we follow this chain even further and two helium-3s collide together, they form helium-4. And helium-4 is the most stable isotope of the next element in the periodic table. And the whole universe was doing this in these first minutes after the Big Bang. And that meant that so much helium was produced that after this period, there was 25% helium and 75% of the protons in terms of the matter that was made up from quarks. And so we ended up after this section with a collection of these helium nuclei, as well as protons and electrons, which I haven't mentioned since the early because they haven't really done anything yet. But when the universe reached 380,000 years old, something very special happened. Now, this is much further on in the lifetime of the universe, but still quite a long time ago. And the universe had expanded and cooled down till about uh, deep space was about a thousand times hotter than it was today. And at this point, the electrons with a negative charge and the protons with a positive charge or the helium nuclei with a doubly positive charge could no longer escape the force of attraction from electromagnetism. And so the proton combined with a single electron to form an atom of hydrogen, while the nucleus of helium combined with two electrons to form an atom of helium. And so for the first time, we end up with electrically neutral atoms, which is the next stage in this matter becoming lower and lower in energy. And 
after that we get to 400 million years or that there, there are there are a range of estimates as to exactly when this happened in the universe but hundreds of millions of years after the big bang these this cloud of 25 percent helium gas and 75 percent hydrogen gas grew to sizes hundreds of thousands of light years across and when they were hundreds of thousands of light years across and the universe had cooled down enough then the weakest force of all could start to take hold on such large masses and clouds of gas and what happened was that um, the cloud of gas attracted itself from one side to the other and eventually fell inwards and contracted inwards now just like a ball falling down a hill rolling down a hill that gravitational potential energy as they fell inward became kinetic energy and the particles collided with one another and started to heat up as they heated up they got to a temperature where the electrons had enough energy to escape the attraction to protons and to helium nuclei to form a, a state of matter called a plasma but then they continued to collapse and if they collapsed enough and produced enough heat in the center then it was it recreated the early universe conditions in those first few minutes in a very small location in space and that allowed the formation of one of these a protostar and the protostar was the first step to creating even even more chemical elements and at the heart of this protostar what was happening was as mentioned exactly what happened in the first few minutes of the universe protons were being transformed into neutrons and protons and neutrons were being combined to form helium gas essentially a proton is like is the nucleus of a hydrogen atom so we say hydrogen is being fused into helium in the heart of this protostar and in fact most uh, in fact all stars spend the majority of their life over 90 percent of their life doing this exact process our sun right now is doing this in its very core and um, it will be doing that hopefully for another good few six to seven billion years um, and this is good because when you are creating helium from hydrogen when you are fusing helium from hydrogen it releases huge amounts of energy and that energy in the form of light as it's trying to push its way out of the center of the star pushes back against gravity gravity is always going to be pulling inwards always pulling that that gas and plasma inwards but if you produce enough light that wants to escape it pushes outwards to the point where the ball of gas stops collapsing and that's where our sun is is there's this fine balance between the gravity pulling the plasma and the mass of the sun in and the light produced in the center pushing that plasma out and this is as i say the main part of a star's life and it's called the main sequence and this is indeed actually a picture of our own sun now our own sun um, will enter a next phase and this next phase is called the red giant phase and if you want to know how large our sun will become in this phase um, there's the sun for comparison and that will be the size of our sun um, when it enters its red giant phase about a hundred times the size it is now it will it will engulf mercury and venus and encroach you know quite far out towards uh, the orbit of the earth and why does it do this why does it expand outwards um, and some of them can be up to 200 times the size of the sun well what's happening in the center is it's used up most of its um, protons um, and essentially in the very center we're now full of helium-4 nuclei but the helium-4 nuclei have a positive two charge and so they require more energy to collide into one another to stick together the only way they get, get this energy is when the amount of fusion stops the star collapses and heats up and as it heats up 
it then allows the helium to be able to smash into one another to fuse. But the problem is, if two helium nuclei fuse together, they form beryllium-8, which is sadly very unstable. In fact, the reason being that the helium-4 were actually lower in energy than the beryllium-8. And so why would it want to be a higher energy beryllium-8 if it could be two lower energy uh, helium-4s? But in its very short lifetime, if another helium-4 hits into a beryllium-8 nucleus, it will produce something which is stable and is lower in energy than the helium-4, and that is carbon-12. And carbon-12, of course, as we know, is the backbone of all of life on Earth. It's the backbone of all of those organic molecules that allow all those complex things to actually occur. And so carbon-12 is is produced in that red giant phase. Now, our sun won't enter this next phase that I'm going to talk about. It's just too small. In fact, it will fizzle out once it's produced a little bit of carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. But stars that are much larger will have so much more gravity that they can continue falling inwards and heating up the center so that more fusion can occur. Now, a red supergiant is the next phase and just to give you a perspective here's the sun and the red supergiant well we're just about seeing the surface of the red supergiant on the right hand side of the screen because they are hundreds to a thousand times the size of our sun these things are huge they're solar system sized beings um, and the reason they're so large is because they have many more ways of producing the light to push out against gravity. So not only can they turn protons into helium, and not only can they turn helium into carbon, but they have other methods of producing light, and that extra light pushes out even further against gravity to create such a large star. And what happens is heliums get stuck onto carbon because they are traveling fast enough that they can overcome their repulsion. Adding one helium to carbon produces oxygen-16, again, an important, um, uh, an important atom, an element for life on Earth. Adding another one produces neon-20. Another one produces magnesium-24, which is important for photosynthesis, and so on. We keep adding these helium nuclei to form silicon, which, which along with oxygen um, creates over 90% of the crust of the earth and the rock beneath our feet, and then sulfur, argon, and we go on and on. If the star is large enough, it can keep fusing past titanium through chromium onto iron 52 and eventually forming something called nickel 56. Now, nickel 56 um, isn't hugely stable simply because um, there is there is a, a, a version of an atom, uh, sorry, version of a nucleus, which is more stable, very close by, and that is iron 56. And what happens there is two of the um, protons turn into neutrons to form iron 56. But once we've reached iron 56, we've hit a bit of a dead end because iron 56 is the lowest energy atomic nucleus that exists in nature. That's a bit of a worry for a star because a star is in the process, sorry, is in the business of producing energy to fight against gravity. So this is a bit of a worry because no longer do you have anything that you can stick together to produce the energy that you need to push out against gravity. And so in our main sequence star, we were turning hydrogen into helium. In our... Um, red giant star we were turning that helium into carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and then in our final star our star which is much more massive than the sun we produce a star which has this onion like structure where we have a smattering of different elements but right in the center we have all of this buildup of iron that we can't do anything with because if we wanted to stick anything to it that would require require, require energy we can't use energy because we need it to push back against gravity. And so eventually what happens is as the iron builds up, the amount of fusion dies away. And at that point, 
everything collapses. The whole star collapses inwards and bounces back off of a very solid, dense core and creates an explosion. And this explosion is otherwise known as a type 2 supernova. And when a star dies in this fashion, it can outshine all of the other stars within the galaxy it lives in for a brief moment. But the cloud around it is all of those elements, all of those rich elements that were locked up within that star to begin with, but they were then thrown out into the cosmos. And in fact, new elements were produced in that explosion. And that's where we're kind of going to leave it. We're going to talk a little bit about those elements. So this, this um, graph shows us the origin of the elements on the periodic table in our universe. You'll notice in blue, this is the Big Bang fusion that I was talking about in those first few minutes. So the hydrogen, and you can see almost entire entirely the helium in our universe um, is made up of um, the hydrogen and helium that have been around since the Big Bang. In green, we get the elements that were produced in the deaths of low mass stars similar to our sun. And in yellow, we get the um, elements that were made in that supernova explosion of massive stars. But that doesn't explain all of the elements on the periodic table. There are some more complicated um, requirements to create other elements. Certainly in purple, we require um, two dead remnants of supermassive stars to actually merge with one another to produce some of those heavier rare earth elements. And so these rare earth elements down the bottom are rare because they happen in rare astrophysical events, whereas carbon, oxygen, and, and the lighter elements are much more plentiful simply because they are produced within the heart of much more numerous low mass stars. And the slightly heavier elements um, here in between are slightly rarer, um, so rarer than the lighter elements, but a little more prevalent than the heavier ones, again, simply because um, they are produced in um, massive stars, which are rarer than those, those sun-sized sun low mass stars. So um, what I've tried to go through in this talk is quite a lot. I appreciate this. So I hope that um, if something hasn't made sense and you go back and you rewatch this, it'll make a bit more sense. Um, if that if not, then there's there's lots more um, out there to hopefully help you digest this a little bit more. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that I slightly cheated at the beginning. I, I started off not at the Big Bang, but a tiny, tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. OK so tiny that you wouldn't even notice that it had flitted by. But the reason being that our current understanding of um, particle physics and uh, everything involved with it has a very hard physical limit. It has a horizon, and that horizon is known. Um, it is the Planck energy or the Planck scale. Um, and um, that is built into the standard model of particle physics. And so this real horizon is where research is being done. So can we push back into the earlier higher energy universe and understand a little bit more? Well, that is for this next generation of scientists to understand. And I'm hoping by learning through analogies and figuring out where analogies break down, you will become better researchers and better at understanding exactly why these scientific theories cannot explain all of nature right now. And essentially as well, at the other end of the spectrum, we really don't know where the universe or how the universe is gonna end. But I know that all of my Lego sessions usually end in this way, with me having to tear apart all of the bricks, which actually gives you rather sore hands. Now, I'm really sorry that we haven't been able to do this workshop in person because it's so much more fun if we do this at a slower pace and everyone gets to play with the Lego. But thank you very much for listening to my talk. And I really look forward to hearing your questions. Oh, and just one quick plug. If you would like to learn more, 
Um, there is, uh, I have started making some YouTube videos. Um, there are a lot of effort, but if people like them, I'll keep on going with those. Um, I've also got some resources, uh, not only in um, the book, which is available, um, but um, also on my homepage as well, uh, especially if you're uh, interested in learning particle physics for A-level um, or are just interested in actually playing around and building your own universe. There's a poster there where you can download the instructions and play along. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. That was absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed it as well. I'm sure everyone does as, as well at home. I was literally just about to say about your amazing book uh, and ask you to plug it because it is brilliant. I have a copy here. Uh, we also have a tit. Uh, for anyone who's interested at the OU, we have a tit of your outreach for all the books that you to mate with all the, all the Lego as well. And it's great. So if anyone's interested, get in touch with us at the OU. But I definitely recommend the book. We've got a number of questions coming through. So if you've got any questions, please send them through to the email address that's on the page that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, stem-sbs-iop-lectures at open.ac.uk. It should be on the page as well. And before I forget, to, just to remind you, please fill in the, uh, the survey. Uh, even if you filled it in before, please fill it in again. A lot of your comments we, that we've had previously, we're trying to take into hand and make sure we, we keep updating this, uh, the lecture series as we do. So just make sure if you have filled it in before, please fill it in again this time as well. Thank you. On to questions. So I've got first question that's come through. What is the biggest nucleus that you have made so far from, <laughs> from Ledo? That's awesome. Um, well, I've done a number of workshops and some of them have been whole day long. And so we set ourselves this challenge um, and we did actually build Ogneson. Um, that's that's how much time we had. So Ogneson is element 118. It's the last element currently on the periodic table. Um, so we did make an isotope of Ogneson. So, um, you know, we've, we've pretty much maxed out on that. We haven't been adventurous and gone beyond, say, to, you know, the uh, theoretical elements like Feynmanium 126 or anything like that yet. But uh, we did manage to get Ogneson in a day. So we were proud. How of big it. did that end up? How big was that in sale in Ledo? Was it was it like table we, size or we, we, we built it like a tower because it wouldn't support itself so we had to build it like a tower i mean the the, the yeah i mean the, the largest one i've done in that stack formation is um is a rather neutron poor version of uranium so um, oh i ben literally asked me earlier i wonder if he has a copy of uranium near him that'd be that'd be great if you see it so yeah that's that would be one of our questions we were wondering that's fascinating. And how did that take all day to make? Was it a was it a long? Because because I was doing rolling workshops, I kind of used other people's work. So pe people would have made people would have made say uh, a magnesium or something, and so I just kind of begged and borrowed that and stuck it on top. So I didn't do all the work. It was a group effort, to be honest. <laughs> that, that's the way I would definitely do it. Yeah. Uh, so I've got another question comes coming through. Is at what point? Do you think your analogy breaks down? Can it go further into like gravitons, the theoretical gravitons, gluons, tauons? Uh, does that is that covered in your book as well? Um, it is it is covered, but I have to say the the Lego analogy does break down when you start to have to require certain things about the particle behaviour that are unique to their wave-like or field-like properties. Um, that's when it's very difficult because obviously we are at the moment dealing with these particles as if they are particle like. But we have to remember that all of these things are quanta um, and quantum objects um, behave particle like and wave like at different times. They are neither one or the other. Um, and so what we're dealing with here is we're, we're dealing with a broad brushstroke in talking about just the particle side of these um, particles with very definitive properties. As soon as you get into the idea of having to combine those wave-like, those wave function-like um, properties, it does get very difficult. And so um, we could, uh, and, and I do hyper come up with some hypothetical uh, Lego brick to represent the graviton, um, but you know, the, the, the deeper physics um, you know, actually, we have to leave the Lego behind a little bit and we have to delve into new territory. So that's really where it kind of breaks down. But I'm hoping that just through the Lego, it's enough to give a hook and an understanding that 
the next stage and the leap to the idea of fields and um, and things like that hopefully will be a little easier to digest. But it's all in it, it, that is all in the book, the leap to you thinking of things in terms of waves and fields as well. I suppose a next question to ask is you talked at the end of your slides about the next steps of, of the current frontier of research. Yeah. So I've got a question here is what do you think the next big discovery in particle physics will be and where do you think it will come from? Do you think it'd be CERN or do you think it'd be from somewhere new coming out at the moment? I mean the beauty is I think that we, we really don't know because currently um, the, all of the results coming out of so in particle physics there are different what we call frontiers and the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is at the high energy frontier um, which means that essentially it gets the biggest bang for its buck it's the hugest amount of energy and by doing that of course um einstein tells us that e equals mc squared so with a large amount of energy you can create large mass particles and so if there are particles with really high masses out there then the high energy frontier is where you're going to be looking um to try and maybe actually see them physically and 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 certainly see them decaying into other particles um, but then there is another frontier which is the uh, high luminosity frontier in which we have particle accelerators which instead of increasing the energy increase the number of particle interactions that are happening um, and that's more like searching for a needle in a haystack now you might think you might not be able to search for high mass and new particles that way but actually you can through a quirk of quantum mechanics called the uncertainty principle because for a short amount of time you can borrow a large amount of energy which means that essentially you can borrow a large amount of energy in very rare occasions and so if you have huge numbers of particles interacting, then you actually then increase the likelihood that you might see rare showings of, of these particles. And so you can use the high energy and the high luminosity frontier to try and come together to understand. Um, and I, I can't forget to mention also the neutrino sector, because neutrino physics is still um, you know, being understood we have made great leaps in the past few decades of our understanding of neutrinos um, and actually they seem to be a possible key to unlocking um, the uh, our understanding as to where all these building blocks came from in the first place so my answer is that um, there are searches going on in multiple fronts right now everything seems to be explainable using the standard model which is frustrating, really frustrating. And until we get some kind of evidence that cannot be explained by the standard model, we, we are really just feeling in the dark a little bit as to what route is the correct route to go down mm -hmm. theoretically. There are some beautiful theories um, which obviously marry together lots of ideas, but as an experimentalist, I have to say with a passionate heart that until we get solid evidence, we're not actually going to get even uh, the slightest chink of light to guide us in a particular direction. Um, so it's exciting because it can come from anywhere, basically. I suppose in the next question that would loop in really well with that is we just had a question from Sheldon is, do you think that the future of particle physics research will require larger and more powerful colliders? Or should we try and use, look at different avenues to try and explore? Is it uh, bigger and better or? Interesting. So, I mean, well, historically, particle physics has gone in in different cycles. So right now, um, the LHC is a discovery machine. OK, it's a bit down and dirty because it uses protons and protons, as we said, are bags of quarks. Um, so much like smashing together two bags of groceries, you're going to produce quite a mess and figuring out exactly what went on in that mess takes quite a lot of work um, which will come with associated errors um, whereas the previous so the predecessor to the large hadron collider and um, which used to occupy that 27 kilometer ring um, was the large electron positron collider and that used electrons and positrons which as we say are their own particle that there's nothing inside of them and so when they collide together they form something which is a lot cleaner a lot crisper and therefore comes with lower errors and a much more much more certainty about the properties that you're measuring 
Now, the reason that the large electron positron collider was created was because before that, there was a discovery machine that had discovered particles associated with the weak force called the W and Z. They discovered them, but to really understand them and really pin down their properties, they had to have clean events and clean collisions. And so they went to uh, an accelerator with an electron and a positron. And so the likelihood is, and the, the, the talk is, that um, what would be the next move would require um, a slightly higher energy version of the um, uh, electron-positron collider that previously existed at CERN, such that we can actually produce Higgs particles in, in that huge numbers. Because, again, we've discovered the Higgs boson and we're starting to understand its properties. But really, to truly understand it, maybe we need a precision machine like an electron positron collider. So that might be the next step. But as I mentioned, um, there are different frontiers, right? The high energy frontier of the Large Hadron Collider is just one frontier. OK, and so for that, yes, you do need bigger and better kind of um, colliders. Um, but when we're talking about the luminosity frontier, and in fact, the LHC has recently upgraded its luminosity. Um, when we're talking about the luminosity frontier, it might just be that we need smarter or better technology in our already existing structures so that we can increase luminosity and increase the way in, uh, the number of events and maybe even improve the way in which we're picking out that information and that data. That helps. That's, that's brilliant, thank you. I, was, I mean, I suppose the question is, do you think this research will remain, do you think there's an opportunity for it to remain Earth-based, or, or as we, I suppose a lot of your research is looking up and we're seeing what's in the, what's around us and whether we're doing more sort of space-based research on this in the future? Or do you think it will still remain linear, sort of linear and circular accelerators? I think, I think we're going to be terrestrial. Uh, we, we're we're going to be Earth-based. Um, simply because of the amount of material it will require to create accelerators um, within that region. Because we, we need to create rather large, I mean, the, the magnetic fields that bend the particles around the LHC are many thousands of times greater in magnitude than the Earth's magnetic field. I mean, it's, it's kind of very specialised highly localized magnetic fields that we require and that can only really be produced right now using um, these superconducting magnets these superconducting uh, coils and so um, you can't really move away from the fact that you need quite a lot of technology around these beam pipes that carry the particles wherever you are um, and so I don't think that space on earth is going to become too limiting a factor too soon um, but then again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but of course, gravitational wave research is, is exciting and that's going into space with the LISA uh, yes. project. Yeah, that should be, a, hopefully be really exciting. Yeah. Uh, question has come through, would you, would it be interesting to give sort of an overview of your work in a bit more detail that you were doing at T2K, uh, just so to have a bit of background in some of the neutrinos, would that be okay? Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, so um, T2K, or its full name, Tokai to Kamioka, uh, which are two regions of Japan, um, fires a beam of neutrinos 295 kilometers from the west coast, sorry, from the east coast of Japan over to a detector in the west. Um, the detector in the west is quite famous. Uh, it's actually um, it's actually led to uh, the Nobel Prize back in, when was it, 2010. Um, and uh, it's called Super Cameo Kande. It's a massive vat of water, 33 Olympic sized swimming pools in volume. Um, and it sits there looking for the very rare occasion that a neutrino will pop in and it will, through the weak force, transform into an electron or a muon or a tau, a particle with electric charge. And then those particles will leave wisps of light that can be detected. Um, and what T2K did was it was looking into um, a special phenomenon of neutrinos, which is called oscillation. And I said that there was a definite electron type, a definite muon type and a definite tau type. Right. Forget that. The neutrino can actually change between those different types 
or what we call flavors. So the electron muon and tau are what we would call a flavor of neutrino. Um, and you can create a neutrino as one flavor and then later on measure it and find that it's actually changed to a different flavor. And this is a process of oscillation. Now, it sounds really bizarre and it sounds like it might be beyond the standard model. Well, it, it is beyond what the standard model was originally because it does require neutrinos to have mass. But it can be explained um, through through standard quantum mechanics. Um, and and this process has been studied. It was it was discovered um, in 1998. Um, by Super Cameo Kande, um, and has since been has since been more and more understood. But the reason T2K was really interested in, it, and the reason that the next generation of neutrino experiments are going to be really exciting, is because um, the way in which neutrinos tend to change seems to be different to the way that antimatter versions, antineutrinos, oscillate as they go from one place to another. Now this is interesting because this is something in nature which seems to treat matter and antimatter differently. But what we see in most of our particle physics um, interactions is that matter and antimatter are treated on an equal footing. Now, the reason that we need matter and antimatter to be treated differently is because you can create matter and antimatter from energy, so from something like the Big Bang, but if they're created in equal amounts, that's a problem because matter and antimatter are total opposites. Okay, the electron has a negative charge, the positron has a positive charge. They come together, they annihilate and form pure energy again. Um, and that would be an issue because if you started from pure energy, created equal amounts of matter and antimatter, then they would eventually annihilate and form just pure energy again. So there must be something in the universe, some kind of process which prefers matter over antimatter because obviously the entire visible universe we see is made out of matter. But that that imbalance is only about one part in 10 million. And so by looking at the way neutrinos oscillate and by looking at the way that antimatter versions oscillate, if there's a difference, that can point us towards the underlying theory of why there is all this matter in the universe and no antimatter. That's amazing. That is it still running? Is it? Is it? Or it's is it still running? Yeah, it's still running. It's still publishing. Um, and in fact, I think it was. Yeah, it was one of uh, Nature's uh, top ten uh, discoveries this year for um, that recent paper on that exact topic between matter and antimatter. So uh, in 2020, Nature chose. Uh, uh, 10 um, groundbreaking uh, pieces of research and uh, T2K was in there um, for the um, latest paper on this exact topic of the imbalance between matter and antimatter because they found the first hint of this imbalance in neutrinos. So that should be out there if anyone wants to go and, go and read up on it on it further. I'm going to ask one final question that's come through. So I think it was in my bio when I wrote about it, or spoke about you. Uh, I mentioned that you went off into, uh, just, uh, initially interested in rotic science, and then you got swayed. You drew to, drawn <laughs> away from us space science scientists uh, to uh, go into particle physics. And the question I've got here is, what drew you into it? And I suppose what we've got a lot of uh, our A-level students here on the at the moment on the tool. What was it that initially interested you in going off and studying physics in the first place, if that's okay? Um, I always just found that physics spoke to me. Uh, well, not spoke to me, but it just 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 seemed to click. Um, I'm not sure what it was about physics. It just seemed to it just seemed to click. I think I think as a teenager, and I'll be perfectly honest, I was pretty lazy. Um, and what I loved about physics was you could learn a little use a bit of intuition and do a hell of a lot um and once you'd understood a concept you could run with it in lots of different directions and do fantastic things um and so i wasn't a fan of learning names um you know i'd never be an ornithologist i'd never learn the names of species i'm terrible at that kind of thing um but but I, I was someone who would love to learn a little and be able to do a lot with it. And that's what I loved about physics, because believe it or not, physics is extremely creative. You can learn a little bit. You can learn one or two equations and then you can manipulate those equations and you can do some brilliant, fantastic things with them that 
you originally didn't think you could do from that starting point and that's that's what i loved about physics i think um and that's what led me into um wanting to do i mean i, I always had a childhood dream of being an astronaut and that's what led me into an interest in space science um and really how i got into particle physics was happen chance because um, I was applying for summer schools in between my third and fourth year. So I did an undergraduate master's, which is four years long. And between my third and fourth year, I was applying for summer placements. Um, and uh, I wanted to get into propulsion systems, but I'm, I'm quite old. And at that time, uh, essentially, propulsion systems were the protected right of the governments um, that were working on them. And we didn't have any propulsion system labs really in the UK at, the, at that time. And so I was applying to the US and being told by JPL and lots of other labs that no, because I wasn't an American citizen, I couldn't do their summer placements. And then I got a place on a summer school at Durham, which was the International Undergraduate Summer School in uh, Particle Physics and Astrophysics. Um, and I just got working with this really interesting postdoc uh, who was talking about neutrinos. And I just, again, found that interest and that passion of being given an equation and then using that to develop ideas about fundamental physics and that that that's what then just lured me in and then when I went back in my fourth year I, I'm not ashamed to say I did very little space science and I focused on um, more of the astro and particle and just consumed as many of those courses as I could really um, so all I'm going to say is to anyone that is thinking about what they want to do in the future is just that every stage follow your interest and follow your passion um, and if you're putting your all into it, then that's the best thing you can ever do. That is a brilliant answer. Thank you so much. I hope that everyone who's at home listens to it and takes heed. It is a brilliant way to go forward with it. I will. I think I will wrap up now, if that's OK. And I will say thank you once then to Ben. That has been fascinating. I hope everyone's taken away a lot from it. Uh, just a quick reminder that we will be having our next lecture on the second Tuesday of February, being given by Nick Braithwaite uh, starting at 7.30. But just remember to keep an eye on our webpage and our social media, because we may have some opportunities to be involved in that lecture at that point. But otherwise, I will say good night, and I hope you have a very warm and happy new year, and take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night, all. Bye-bye.